good morning everyone and welcome to the first online seminar for March uh, which is the latest in Connor's QS series today he's looking at final accounts um, as always I'm sure you will have plenty of questions for Connor this seems to be a, a very popular topic so if you could use the Q&A and chat uh, tools in the bottom toolbar there and then Connor will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible at the end of his presentation uh, good morning, Connor. Good morning, Julie. Uh, good morning, everyone. I will hand over straight to you and let you get straight on with it. Great. Thanks, Julie. Uh, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> yeah, so this morning we're looking at uh, the topic of final accounts. Uh, this is actually the first time we've we've run this uh, uh, webinar, and it seems to be uh, quite popular and a lot of pre-submitted questions, um, which we're going to come on to. Uh, later on, I say at the at the end of the webinar, just to uh, just to go go through those and explain uh, the different points of view. Okay, great. So look, we we'll get going. Um, so that's me, bit of bit of my background there. Uh, yeah, housekeeping. Yeah. So we we'll love the you know, we we'll love the questions. Um, if you want to put them in the chat box, we'll uh, we'll pick them up at the end. Okay. Uh, the agenda. So I have tried to uh, think of the best way to explain this. There's so there's effectively three parts. First of all, we're going to deal with practical completion and the final account process, uh, you know, when PC is achieved or about to be achieved. Um, and we'll go into some detail on, you know, what in fact uh, practical completion means. Uh, we'll then deal with the final payments. Um, it's, it's worth looking at this because it often gets, um, I guess, confused with final, you know, a final account payment. The two are actually not the same. Um, so we can go into uh, some detail on that to try you know, to explain it um, in more detail. And part three, we're going to look at uh, resolving final accounts um, and true, true disputes. And and, this, and especially we're going to look at a uh, you know a case of uh, Grow versus S and T and what the position is now. Um, if you are trying to start a final account adjudication. Uh, but you've had a smash and grab adjudication uh, before you previously, and there has been a change in the law. I mean, it, this is probably maybe 12, 18 months ago now, uh, but it's worth going through because, again, it's it's a concept that, um, you know, floats around, but is commonly, um, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions about what it actually means as well. So we'll deal with that in part three, okay? Right, so part one. So. Yeah, so part one. So we're looking at the PC stage. So here, so just a quick overview about what goes on here is that you know, following following PC, and, and it's important to bear in mind that point following PC because um you know you do get a lot of final accounts come through um before PC. Now, I mean that doesn't mean that that they're invalid, but the contract does say to issue the uh, the final account following PC. So do bear that in mind. Um, obviously, if you're submitting a, a final account and you haven't actually a, achieved completion, there's more than likely going to be adjustments required. So, and if I'm the employer assessing a final account, I want to be dealing with the very last version, not to be dealing with um, earlier versions, which are now invalid because of progress that's been made on site. Okay, so that's following PC. Um, the contractor must issue a final account and then the employer assessment and issues a final payment notice. I mean, you know, that's very high level stuff, but broadly, that's really what we're talking about here um, at the practical completion stage. Okay, so what is practical completion? So it's, um, you know, it's a term of art in industry really, but it, there is actually no precise legal definition of what practical completion is. Uh, Keating on construction contracts is very good on this point. Um, and we'll see later that it was uh, that it, in, in the case of Mears versus Cost Plan that uh, they agreed with the interpretation under Keating, which is uh, a is that the works can be practically complete and and include latent defects. Now, latent defects are obviously the defects which cannot be seen. I mean, obviously they can be they can exist, but um, often a PC you won't actually know that there is a latent defect because it won't be. It won't be obvious if it's not, you know, you can't pick, you can't pick it up just by looking at, at the works. Often the consequence of a latent defect won't be realized um, until, a, until a later date. Uh, usually, 
Uh, ideally, during the defect liability period, which is a 12 month period following PC, but obviously it can happen later than that. And, and, the, and the contractor's liability um, for those periods will depend on whether he has signed a contract as a deed or as a simple contract. I mean, a deed is 12 year liability and, um, and a simple contract is six years. So, so latent defects can be present and then you can get PC. Okay, second ground is a PC cert may not be issued if there are patent defects. A uh, rectification period is provided for latent defects. I mean, that, so that's what you're saying following on the earlier ground. Um, I mean, if there are patent defects, they should be visible and the contractor should be able to deal with them. And the, uh, the architect or whoever's certifying PC has the right to withhold the PC cert if patent defects are present. C, so the PC means the completion of all construction work has to be done. So that means all work agreed under the contract has actually been carried out by the contractor. Uh, before finally, D, the architect has discretion to decide on minor, minor items of work left incomplete based on the minimus principle. So if, if the work, if the, if the minor items are de minimis, you know, they're, you know, they're minor snags, um, then, you know, the, the architect has got some discretion there uh, to see whether he's happy to, to certify PC or not. Um, so guidance came from the Court of Appeal in Mears versus Cost Plan Services in 2019, uh, which Severshem Exash was involved in. I uh, represented the uh, successful party there. Uh, and Waxman, uh, Justice Waxman cited and approved the Keating approach above. Um, so Coulson, who was also involved uh, on the Court of Appeal, he concluded by that confirming practical completion is perhaps easier to recognize than it is to define. Um, and that's, that's kind of the leading example, that's kind of the leading explanation um, at present of what PC actually means. Um, it's easier to recognize than it is to define. And that's like, you know, stepping into the, you know, the, the shoes of the architect at the end of the project and looking around and seeing, you know, is this, is this project complete? Um, and and am, I in, am I now in a position that I can certify PC? If so, you know, go ahead. But how do you, it's very hard to define that. So I quite like that um, explanation from Coulson, um, which which is it does it's it's a good example of just how difficult it is to actually uh, confirm what PC is. So final point here is that many schedules of amendments uh, now define all actions required to achieve PC. Uh, this is yeah, this has become quite. Um, quite popular in schedules of amendments where, uh, you know, the employer wants to make it clear exactly the actions that, you know, the contractor has to have carried out in order to get PC. And um, this can include, you know, the submission of uh, O&M manuals, uh, submission of ASBEL drawings, uh, obviously the works having been complete, um, you know, usually it would call for like a snagging process, perhaps, um, you know, a month or two prior to when the contractor expects to achieve PC. And that what that does is it gives the parties a chance to uh, meet on site and, and, and draw up a, a snag list as um, as both parties see it, you know, see, you know, a month or two before PC is actually uh, due. It, it's better to do that because uh, rather than waiting until uh, PC that, you know, really what you want to do is action your snagging list, um, you know, before that, before that, um, before that occurs, that will just save uh, any any delays in getting PC um, at the end. So yeah, so that's that's a bit on, on practical completion. Now, I mean, the you know the, the, the bulk of a of a final account, you know, as we all know, and I know there's a lot of uh, you know quantity surveyors on on this uh, on this webinar, and and a lot of it is around you know adjustments. You know, what adjustments do I need to make? Um, when I'm submitting my final account. So basically here's a, you know, a bit of a list and we go into a bit more detail on these um, in, the, in the following slides. So, it's, so basically it means the contract sum is adjusted and that is either by you know, true variations, loss and expense, liquidated damages, fluctuations, um, acceleration quotations, uh, provisional sum adjustments, contra charges, nominated subcontractor supplier uh, payments, amounts associated with the right of uh, suspension and finally the release of retention. So 
look, there's quite a few adjustments there. Um, I tried to, I, I, I'm not sure. I hope somebody could maybe point out um, something that may not be on there. Uh, I was trying to think of more. That's what I, you know, that's what I was, able, was coming up with. So we're going to go into these in, in a bit more detail here. So obviously the first one, you know, really your contract sum, you know, it's amended. Primarily it's amended through the variation section. So the question here is, as a contractor, you know, uh, properly utilize the variation clauses um, and, the, as, and have star rates been used where possible? I say star rates, that's rates that have been included um, in the original bill of quantities. Um, now, in my experience, this is actually one of the areas for, you know, where, um, you know, differences occur because um, the, where the variation clauses haven't been used in accordance with the contract. Um, you know, there is a, a desire from a lot of, you know, a lot of surveyors to move away from bill rates, per, particularly where the bill rates may not be uh, generous to the contractor and, and move to first principles um, a, and a potentially loss in, at the same time, you know, perhaps into loss and expense. I mean, you know, really you should be able to use the star rates for a lot of what occurs on site. Obviously, if you're carrying out work, which is, you know, dissimilar to the work that you've priced in the bill of quantities, then it's really difficult. But the first question I think when it comes to PC is, you know, if I'm the contractor's QS, you know, have I properly utilized variation clauses? Um, that is a key requirement. And, and it's really, it's about, you know, JCT, it's about becoming very familiar with the, you know, with the section five clauses and, uh, you know, and changes in conditions um, and understanding what restrictions have been imposed on the works. Um, you know, throughout the contract, and all, and always, you. Uh, my experience is that you would have more success, um, in getting your variations dealt with fairly and quickly, if you are if you are properly using, uh, the contract rates as a starting point. Obviously, there will, you know, as I said, there are works that would be dissimilar. You have to use, you know, first principles, loss and expense. That's that's fine as well. But it's about understanding the distinction and being really comfortable, um. Uh, with your, you know, with understanding when the star rates or when the, the contract rates shall apply. Um, so variations will obviously also include um, add, adds and omits. I mean, if you're on a, a lump sum contract, which pretty much most are these days, all, all of your adds and omits uh, will be included within the variation clauses as well. So that's basically tracking the drawing changes uh, between your co contract drawings and your construction issue drawings also. Okay, next up, so loss and expense. So as a contractor, use loss and expense as a last resort. Um, uh, so uh, that's, I mean, if you, if you read the uh, loss and expense clauses, again, I mean, it's, I, I always think of loss and expense as like, you know, the residue. Um, it's there to pick up anything which can't be dealt with in the, uh, in the contract sum, the variations, the provisional sums. All of those clauses are provided for, and I and I think of last uh, last and expense as as a last resort. Um, obviously, you know you got to ask has the has the project been prolonged? I mean, if the project has been prolonged, um, if the reason for the delay has you know has been caused by the employer, um, and you've been on site longer, and the event is a relevant uh, matter, uh, you know then you'd be entitled to your prolongation prelims also. We can take into account prelim thickening, etc. Et as well. You know that's classic loss and expense uh, area stuff. So yeah, so loss and expense. You know, the, the, there is generally most final accounts will include an element of loss and expense. So that will obviously be in your adjustments um, in, within the final account. Okay, leading in that leads us into LADs. So has the project been completed on time? And um, if not, is the contractor culpable? So. Um, yeah, PC, you know, have you achieved PC in line with the original contract completion date? Um, you know, unfortunately, very few do, um, very few projects do because, you know, delays are so prevalent on construction contracts, just the nature of, what we, of, of what's involved. Um, but if it hasn't been completed on time, you know, uh, I suppose who's responsible? Is the contractor culpable? You know, have they, you know, failed to proceed regularly and diligently. Have they not had have they had inadequate resources on the project, um, or if not, you know, has the has the employer delayed the project? I mean, have they you know caused you know through their own act of prevention, impediment, or default, have they delayed the work? Um, have they you know variations are, are reasons for delay as well. 
you know, and, and within those grounds, within the relevant events, um, you know, the contractor is entitled to um, his extension of time. Now, it's usually, you know, between the loss and expense and the LADs, we, we'll come on to it later in the area of disputes, but I mean, the, the disputes generally do center around um, those two points because the LADs is a big one, um, particularly if there has been delays, especially if there has been substantial delays and it can be quite difficult for the parties to agree to final account. Uh, next up is fluctuations. Now these are struck out more, you know, you know, most most contracts now are lump sum. They don't cater for um, fluctuations. Uh, so, you know, the, the rates for the duration of the work are obviously, you know, are deemed to be fixed. Most scheduled amendments will say that now also. Um, not to be confused with inflation, um, you know, just if the inflation in, in respect of a substantially delayed project, um, you know, there can be grounds for recovery on, on that basis. But generally, the you know, the fluctuation clauses uh, that fluctuations that occur to uh, your, your rates during the course of the work. So generally, you know, if they're that struck out, you can go for them. Um, but just be familiar with what the position is under the contract. Next up, so acceleration. Has there been acceleration on the project? Though the general rule is with acceleration is that it has to be instructed in advance. Uh, you know, you, you, if you're the contractor and you are accelerating, you really need to know the reason why you're doing it. And um, if it is to mitigate your own delay, the additional additional um, sums generally won't be recoverable. And um, if it has been instructed and the parties, you know, and the employer effectively wants the building early or earlier than the original contract completion date, or even it, could, it can also be the case where the the contractor is completing on the original contract completing date, but the employer is recognizing that additional work is required or that they have already delayed the contractor. So again, obviously, if that has occurred, it goes in, a, it goes in as an adjustment. Next up, provisional sum adjustments. So has reasonable evidence been provided on the expenditure of provisional sums? Um, that's you know the, that reasonable evidence point is always um, is a is a, can be a difficult one to manage. Um, but look, contractors need to be you know open and transparent on, on the provisional sum adjustments. Obviously, there is provisional sum contingencies in the original contract sum, and the adjustments need to be made in line with you know what the reasonable costs have been um, in line with those provisional sum items. Again, that goes into your final account. Contra charges, have there been any, uh, can be a contentious area in, its, in itself and um, has reasonable information been provided by the employer. So again, you know, ideally you agree to contra charges as they go. Um, if the contra charges are issued at a late, uh, you know, at final account stage, uh, particularly by the employer, you know, that can be, uh, you know, a, an area of contention between both parties as well, you know, for the employer, you know, these contra charges are not going to, you know, they'll usually have occurred during the work also. Um, so you want, look, you, you should be making the contractor aware of those during the course of the works rather than kind of waiting until final account because that's just going to drag out the, um, the final account process in itself. Uh, so nominated subcontractor supplier pay, uh, payments. So, you know, has there been any issues? Um, you know, generally most most subcontractors, you know, we we don't have many nominated subcontractors anymore. Um, most most of them are named, but because, and the difference being that the, the employer wants the contractor to take responsibility for their performance. So uh, we're actually got a webinar on that uh, later on. So keep an eye out for it. we go into a lot of detail on that area. Um, next up is retention so yeah look pc so that should be first release of retention is the first mighty due so uh, the you know the contractor will want to apply for that so basically you'll have the retention if if the retention is five percent on the project reduce the retention back to two and a half percent that final two and a half percent being um uh, you know released under the terms of the contract uh, generally upon the end of the defects period but it does it, it it's it's changed regularly so do watch watch out for that final one is amount associated with suspension um so has section 112 of the housing grants construction regeneration act been invoked um so yeah if the you know for some if the employer has failed to make a payment um 
and the contractor served notice that he was going to suspend the work and subsequently did suspend the work, well then if there has been a demobilization and remobilization costs associated with it, those adjustments go into the final account also. So yeah, so that's quite a bit of detail on the on the adjustment section. So we'll um, we'll keep going. Uh, final account statement. So so this is basically kind of formalizing uh, the agreement at final account. So I said here that agreement is always better to be formalized uh, using a final account statement or similar. Um, the key clause is that both parties are released from their contractual contract obligations, and neither party has any claims against the other now or in the future. Um, and then you include a final account breakdown as an as an appendix that just shows the build up to the sums uh, upon which the, the final account statement is based. Um, so yeah, really, I, I, you know, I mean, in my days as a QS, I used to have like a template final account statement to use, um, you know, one with subcontractors, one with clients. Uh, the key one is the, you know, and, and, and a lot of the pre-submitted questions relates to this, you know, to the release mechanism um, and how far that goes. Uh, we'll deal with a lot of those questions, um, you know, later on. But I mean, really, the, you know, the release clause, that's where that's where from both sides that you kind of close off your liability. If I, I as a contractor, I mean, I want that release clause to, you know, to deal with any claims that may have existed before PC, but also any potential, you know, future obligations also, if, if possible. Obviously, it depends on the specifics within the contract, but that release clause, the, the extent upon which your final account is agreed often is crit you know is critical um and the release clause is critical to that to really have clarity upon uh, what in fact has been agreed and what your future liabilities are also um so it's always it, it's very important to um to be aware of what your release clause actually means as well okay and I would recommend advice if you're dealing with that because you, you only need to go through it once. If you if you understand it from the from the beginning, uh, you you know it's a scale you, you'll have it you'll have it then forever. And you deal with final account statements very regularly. So yeah, it, it's experience that will stay with you. Part two. So we're going into uh, you know final payment. So again, like, like I said earlier, uh, dealing with final payment because it's it's not the same as your your final account. And it's it's a it's a it's an area that's commonly, um, you know, misconceptions um, are you know apply uh, to it. So we'll, we'll deal with it now. Uh, so again, so final statement. Um, again, final statement is basically, uh, you know, under JCT is treated as you know it's equal to your you know to your final account basically. Um, it's conclusive evidence that uh, the materials, goods, and workmanship are acceptable. That all extensions of time have been granted, and that all loss and expense has been agreed. Um, so, if you're able to issue the final statement, that's it's it's treated as conclusive evidence of, on each of those points. Uh, what happens if you fail to issue a final statement? If it's not issued within three months of practical completion, uh, the employer can issue a notice that find uh, a notice that final statement must be provided within two months. Otherwise, the employer can issue their own final statement. Uh, this then becomes the employer's final statement, um, and it cannot happen. It, sorry, it doesn't happen often, but contractors do need to be aware of it at the same time. And basically, what that is doing is that it's telling the contractor to get on and submit its final statement, its final account, because um, you know the employer doesn't want to be you know holding on forever, waiting for the contractor's um, assessment and. If the you know if the employer issues their um, a notice that it wants the final statement, then the contractor doesn't uh, action it. Then the employer can make its own uh, final statement, and obviously it's not ideal because it's probably going to be an assessment which the contractor is unlikely to be happy with. So um, as I said, it doesn't happen often, but you do need to be aware of it. Uh, that's generally section 1.8 of um, at 424. Uh, or 426 of the JCT Design and Build uh, 2016 contract. Schedule of defects. Um, if any defects, shrinkages, uh, or other faults appear, then the employer must issue a schedule of defects to the contractor within 14 days of the expiry of the rectification period. Uh, this can be issued continuously during the rectification period if the employer decides to do so. 
uh, and when all defects have been made good, the employer shall issue a notice of completion of making good. So the schedule of defects is important. It's an important document uh, to be used by both parties, really, uh, during the defects liability period, because it will have it, it will have an effect on the final payment, uh, which will come on to now. Um, it's a very good document. You know, it's a very important uh, for management tool for the employer, really. Um, and he's got, you know, up until two weeks of um, of the rectification period expiring um, in which to issue it. Unfortunately, if it, you know, if it, if an employer misses that date, it generally means that uh, they've no, you know, they that they've accepted the work and that the notice of completion of making good has effectively been issued to the contractor. Um, so employers need to be, you know, need to be careful uh, with the schedule of defects and ensure that, you know, they're issuing that uh, continuously during the, um, you know, during the during the defects liability period. Very, uh, very important um, for, you know, for those reasons. And, you know, because a contractor is not going to issue it. Um, the onus really is on the uh, on the employer to manage it. Um, you know, in, in practice, I mean, a lot of you know, a lot of contractors know it's know it's expiring, and are happy to kind of to keep their head down because as soon as the 14 days beyond rectification ends, the employer or the contractor is going to be knocking on the door asking for his final payment. Um, so very important point there for for employers if you are, um, you know, managing the uh, the defects period, uh, the defects. Uh, managing defects themselves during the defects liability period. So the final payment process then. So the, the due date for final payment, and I, when I'm, I'm, this example is based on the JCT Design and Build uh, 2016 contract. Um, and it says that the due date for final payment is one month after whichever occurs last. So the top one here, the end of the rectification period of the works or the final section, uh, the date stated in the notice of completion of making good or the date of submission to the other party of the final statement. Now, I mean, the third one will already have happened. I mean, it's very unlikely that um, uh, that the, th the final ground there, the final statement will occur before uh, the end of the rectification period or the notice of completion of making good has been issued. So really the final payment um, is really the second release of your retention. Um, is the final uh, retention amount which the employer has held on the contractor, uh, usually for you know usually for twelve months, but obviously you know that's subject to negotiation, um, and generally the final payment itself is actually the um, is actually that second um, retention or the final retention release. I mean, if you think about it, that is the final payment on the contract. I mean, you know that retention is as important. As um, as any of the other payments on, on the project, because you know in, in industry, you know we work on tight margins. I mean contractors, you know if the retention is if final release retention is two and a half percent, if um, or one and a half percent, I mean that's a significant amount to a contractor's um, uh, overall profit. So um, you know it, it is it's important. It's as important as any other payment under that contract. Um, and that's effectively really what the um, you know what the final payment itself is, and uh, and then the finally the final date for payment is usually fourteen days after the due date, so un unless amended. So there you go, that's the final payment. Um, so it's usually one month after the end of the rectification period, or a date stated on the notice of completion of making good. Um, you know that that date on the notice of completion of making good. You know, it has to be agreed between the parties. So whichever whichever one of those applies, the due date is one month after that, and the final date for payment is fourteen days thereafter. So look, you're on about uh, you're on about forty five day uh, forty five day payment after the end of the rectification period, and that is your final payment. Okay, uh, next is. Okay, part three. So we're looking at um, uh, final account disputes. Um, we'll talk about a bit these a bit generally, and then and we're going to look at uh, you know final account or true value adjudications um, as they relate to final account now also and what the current uh, legal position is. Okay, so 
so just a, yeah just i guess a bit of advice um you know how to avoid final account disputes um final account disputes yeah you basically you try and manage manage it as 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 the project develops um i suppose the top point here is you know agree a rolling rolling final account each month uh, that's kind of a perfect world scenario which doesn't happen very often unfortunately um mm -hmm because you know time pressures i mean unwillingness on either side you know whatever yeah, yeah i mean it's a it's real kind of yeah ideal world scenario that unfortunately doesn't happen very often but i mean look it's not necessary either and um, that would be real kind of a you know belts and braces approach which you know you don't really need either it's just you know being aware of, of what does need to be done throughout to give you the best chance of agreeing your final account and avoiding a dispute uh, you need to proactive approach by the contractor to value adjustments so um you know the adjustments as we discussed earlier you know the contractor needs to be proactive getting his pricing into the employer that shows he's uh, you know build up to variations build up to loss and expense and um, build up to any of the other adjustments i mean re if he's if he's able, if they're submitted monthly and all of the information is there that will give a contractor the, you know a better chance of agreeing um a final account the employer will be fully aware of what the costs are uh, will be able to assess them um again he'll be able to assess them as the project develops and 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 approve sums in the you know in in the interim uh, payments also um so that's you know a good way for the contractor and the contractor qs to basically avoid any any uh, final account dispute um, contractor needs a proactive approach to snagging and defects. I mean, if there are, you know, snagging and defects, um, I mean, one, you, the, the work hasn't been completed in line with the contract. So, uh, you know, our, like the um, most employer QSs will hold money for such items until until they've been completed satisfactorily, and it, it can't blame them. I mean, that's you know, the, the, you know, payment is dependent on the work being completed in, in accordance with the contract. So. Um, the contractor does need to be, um, you know, have a have, take a proactive approach to the sagging and defects, uh, both during the construction phase and also during the defects liability phase. Final point then, you know, just keep good records um, and use them throughout. I mean, it's not necessarily to avoid a final account dispute, but it does at least if um, if anything does happen towards the end, um, you will have the records to be able to rely upon. Uh, should you should you need them to 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 uh, to start out a dispute? So yeah, that's um, some tips to how, how to avoid a final account dispute. So yeah, look, we're going to uh, discuss the true value, um, you know, true value slash final account uh, um, adjudications and what the current uh, law in this area is. Um, when we say true value, you know, we have to start with. Uh, you know the smash and grab adjudications and here's just a quick recap on what smash and grab um, adjudications are um, it, so in essence a smash and grab is is made by a contractor who acts an employer's failure to issue a valid pay list notice by claiming payment of some stated in the interim application that can also be the final account application for payment with no regard to the employer's assessment of the validity of such claims where a project has regular interim payments built in the risk is somewhat lessened uh, by the employer's ability to undo the effects of an unjust claim in the next interim payment. And it was for this reason that contractors have become more likely to pursue a smash and grab uh, style claim uh, on the final account final account payment. Uh, that's where the, where the opp employer's opportunity to undo the claim via the final account process may take months or even or even years. Um, so I mean, this is basically where the law was before uh, Grow versus S and T. Um, if the employer failed to issue his payment or pay less notice, and the contractor had you know proceeded with a smash and grab adjudication and was successful, um, at that time it wasn't available for the employer to uh, re adjudicate or to adjudicate the true value. Um, the employer basically had to challenge it. Um, generally in, in, in litigation proceedings so obviously the you know there has been a change in that position which we'll uh, which we'll go on to know so grow versus s and t as back in uh, back 2018 now uh, so there's significant judgment ruling that the employer was able to challenge the amount due to the contractor as a result of a smash and grab even if there was no valid payment and or pay less notice 
any judgment, uh, Coulson expressed his dissatisfaction even uh, with these type of claims stating that I believe my conclusions would strengthen the system because it would reduce the number of smash and grab claims, which in my view, have brought adjudication into a certain amount of dispute, uh, disrepute. So you can see what Coulson is saying here is that, um, you know, smash, smash and grab, you know, opportunities can occur at any time, but um, when it occurred at final account, because the uh, employer didn't have the ability to re-adjudicate um, the true value, uh, the contractor was more than likely going to take that opportunity at final account than he otherwise would on, say, the interim payments. Reason being is that with interim payments, uh, the employer had the opportunity to correct the assessment effectively the following month. Um, but you see, at final account, he didn't have that opportunity because there was no further payments as such. So again, you can see why Coulson was keen to um, basically reduce the amount of smash and grab type um, adjudications, which, you know, as he said, brought broad adjudication into disrepute. So the issue, so there was many issues in this case, and it's a very good case if you're interested in the law on, uh, you know, valid payment and pay less notices also. Uh, but we're focusing on issue C here. So this is the right to adjudicate the true value. So the conclusions reached in this issue would be of most interest to the construction industry and represent a change of approach from the previous authorities. Coulson was clear that an employer can commence a second adjudication to seek the true value of the sum due where it has failed to serve an effective payment or pay less notice to the contractor's final account application. And he gave six reasons uh, for this in his decision. Okay, so uh, ground one is the early case authority of Henry Boo Construction versus Alstom Combined Cycles noted that it had always been open to the court to revise architect certificates. And this was authority for the court's ability to consider the true value of an interim payment application. And basically he decided that adjudicators had therefore had the same powers. Um, the second ground was that there was no limitation on the nature, scope and extent of the dispute which either side can refer to an adjudicator. And as such, there is no limit or discretion on the power of an adjudicator to decide, it, to decide this issue. Um, the third ground is a second adjudication to consider the true value would be a different dispute um, to the validity of a pay less notice as decided in the first adjudication as it would address questions uh, of, value, of valuation. And therefore there was no issue with, uh, with, with jurisdiction. You know, we know that you can't basically um, adjudicate on the same issue twice. Um, but what he's saying is that the first adjudication is different because the first adjudication is merely finding whether a payment or pay less notice was, was issued. Um, whereas the second adjudication, the true value will be dealing with uh, questions of proper valuation and actually be focused on, you know, what is the actual value of the, the correct value of these works. Um, so really important point is that there was, there was no issue with, the, uh, with, a, with jurisdiction. Uh, the fourth ground was the JCT distinguishes between the sum stated as due, which is the amount in the application for payment, and the sum due, which is the correct payment amount, um, in brackets, the true value. So long as the sum stated as due has been paid, the sum due can be adjudicated. And that's a really important point to understand the, the distinction between the sum stated as due. So that's the sum which uh, the contractor stated was due in his final account application. And um, there's, a, there's a very important difference between that and what the actual sum due is, because, you know, for various reasons, contractors' final accounts uh, can, you know, can be inflated. I mean, you know, it, ha it happens uh, more often than not really. So what he's saying is that, you know, the sum stated as due to so much the contractor is applying for is, is not the same as what the actual sum due is. And um, there's a very important distinction uh, between the two points. He said, so long as the sum stated as due has been paid, the sum due can be adjudicated. Now that's a key point for um, an employer is that if he wants to go for the second adjudication or the true value, um, he's got to pay, he's got to pay the, the sum stated as due first. That is one of the, um, the requirements um, laid down by Coulson. 
in, in growth versus s &T. So that's a really important point to bear in mind as well if you're thinking that, yeah, well, I'll just start up another adjudication um, if you win the first one. You can, but uh, what the law says is that the uh, the sum stated as due must first be paid, or the sum awarded in the in the first adjudication has to be paid. Okay, next round is as a matter of equality and fairness, the employer's ability to adjudicate the true value of the application must be balanced with the contractor's ability to do likewise. It would be wrong to prohibit the employer from doing that, which the contractor can do. So just equality, uh, it's equality and fairness. Um, you know, employer can do it, the contractor can do it also. Um, so, yeah, that's worth noting. Worth noting. Uh, the final point is that there is no there is no justification for the previous authorities that distinguish the employer's ability to adjudicate where there is a final application as opposed to an interim application. There is no such distinction in the JCT form, and there is no difference between payment rights and obligations in respect of interim payments and the final accounts. So yeah, so what he's saying is that you know the employer can uh, can basically undo a smash and grab on, on an interim payment, and what he's saying is that uh, there's no there's no reason why you can't do it on a final account pay payment either. So another reason for deciding that that's exactly what the employer can do um, at the at final account stage. Okay, so this judgment represents a significant change in the TCC approach. Uh, Coulson has endeavoured to bring clarity to the influx of potential issues raised by earlier cases on smash and grab style adjudications and distinctions between interim and final account applications. The comments of the judge have, been, have the potential to reduce the impact of contractors' claims for payment on the basis of failure to serve a pay less or payment notice now that there is authority and support of the employer's ability to quickly bring a second adjudication for the true value of the same application. And the, the key point is that um, in order to do so, you've got to pay the sum stated as due and then re-adjudicate it on the sum due. Um, so yeah, so that just explains uh, what can be, you know, the final account disputes, true value adjudications. Um, it's an important piece of law to bear in mind. Um, if you're not having success in trying to agree to final account, um, you know, Grove versus s and is a very, um, very important case as to how the issue can be finally resolved, i.e. can you, you know, potentially run two adjudications um, or, you know, pre because the position before that was that you could do one adjudication and then you would have to uh, proceed to litigation. So it's a very important point to bear in mind, but do note that if you are the employer, the sum stated as due must be paid. Um, that would depend on that, like that can depend on the financial standing of the parties also, or if you're worried that the, the money may dissipate, that can be dealt with separately. Uh, um, that should be dealt with at, at the time um, also. Right. Uh, look, that's it, guys. That's um that's the, basically the, the three parts. Uh, you know, part one, what you know, what the process is around uh, PC. Part two, we looked at a, the process around the final payment, which effectively is your second release of retention before finally looking at the true value final account uh, process uh, following Go versus s &T, okay? Uh, I believe there's some questions, so I'll hand you back to Julie now, okay? Thanks, everyone. Indeed, the questions have been clicking in as you've been going through. Okay, first question. Once a final account has been signed by all parties, can it be reopened at a later date for additional costs that were originally missed? Yeah. Um, I mean, again, like when we covered earlier on, Julie, we were talking about the final statement. Um, it depends on it depends on the extent of the of the release clause and the drafting of that. I mean, the release clause in a final account statement is basically intended to say that both parties, you know, settle uh, any claims that they may have against each other, or that, you know, basically there's no there's no future payments due, maybe uh, bear the final release of retention. Um, so I mean, like if the contractor has missed costs um, before his final account application, and then decides, you know, then finds out after he signed the final account agreement, I mean, I don't think he's going to have much success with that because that should be covered in the release clause and the employer effectively has been released from that. I mean, this is part of the bargain and part of the reason why, you know, the, it's in the employer's interest as well as the contractors to get um, a robust final account statement agreed. 
Um, but to answer your question, it just comes down to the wording of that, that release clause uh, that should be within the final statement. It sounds like it's going to be a tough look on the contractor, but look, he's got to, he's got to check it out for himself, okay? Okay. Um, PC is often descri described by contract administrators as when you can get beneficial use of the works, uh, e.g. Yeah. you can safely occupy and use an office. Do you have an opinion on this? Yeah, look, it's it's helpful. I mean, the you know, beneficial use, beneficial occupation, absolutely. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the employer wants the building, and um, and if the if the employer does take over sections or or the entire uh, area of the site, then I don't see any reason. You know, that's that's leading into, um, that's leading into the fact that he's accepting the site in that condition, which would support the contractor's position that he has in fact achieved PC. Again, you know, this is the this is why you know practical completion uh, can become a very uh, a very contentious area because it's 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 there's no as I said earlier there's no legal definition about what it is, uh, but the beneficial use beneficial occupation absolutely, um, it does lead into and it all steers towards the fact that that the um, that the contract that the employer is happy uh, to take over the site and as a result he's got the um, beneficial use. He's he's effectively you know he's leading himself into the fact that he's accepted the building in the, in that in that condition. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. Um, next question is: How do you value a special condition? For example, if a contractor needed to revisit an item of the work in isolation, what is the test of reasonableness for valuing? Um, you've got to look at the you know the. The grounds for you know your variation you know is it a change in the condition on site is it a change has there is the work being carried out in different circumstances or under greater restrictions um you know by import which have been imposed by the employer you know you've got to understand um i think it's section 5.2 of um of the jct design and build i'll just use that as an example um you've got to understand you know the conditions what's happened and um, and whether that in fact can be re-rated as a variation under the variation section, because generally, if there's a condition imposed upon you, um, I mean that's not going to affect the price of the you know, say the material price that you had in your contract. The, that material price, it, it, you know, unless it's an exception, is going to stay the same. You know, really, what you're going to have to do is assess the you know the plant and labour allow allowance in the contract rate. And basically, pro rata those to take into account the fact that the you're carrying out the same work, but it's going to take a longer time. If it is, then you're going to be entitled to an uplift on your on your labour and plant rates. So, I mean, it, again, it, it's it, this is the nuts and bolts of surveying. This is you know really digging into understanding what is in your contract, what was the production uh, you know envisaged or that is reasonable uh, within your your bill, your your bill rates, and then being you know having the ability to go in and adjust those to reflect the changes imposed. Um, mm. That's it. Look, if it's if if changes have been imposed that um, that bear no relation to any of the rates in the bill of quantities, then you're entitled. You know, you price it on you know a fair and reasonable basis on first principles. Um, but again, it's just really it's really focusing in on the variation clauses. Okay. Um, okay. Someone's just saying here. You mentioned a, a list of items, um, and someone's saying here that one item potentially missed from the adjustment list, which they typically have a line item for, relates to interest um, on late payment. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if the payments have occurred and you're entitled to interest on that under the contract, which you generally are, yeah, good one. I'll, I'll have to update the sides, Julie. <laughs> I'll make I was a test. That. I, that was a test for everyone, you see. <laughs> Someone's just passed that test. <laughs> yeah, very good. Um, well spotted. If the employer issues a final account statement after two months and the contractor disagrees, what happens next? Is that adjudication? Potentially, yeah, that's where you're headed. I mean, it depends. I mean, look, it depends on on the scope of the of the difference between the parties. I mean, if you're talking about relatively small sums that can be agreed. In a you know in a final account meeting you know obviously then that's what you should do like I mean it it just it it's it's it depends on the on the on the gap I guess between 
what the employer thinks it's worth and what the contractor thinks it's worth because yeah you know, the smaller the gap the greater opportunity to agree it the larger the gap i'm afraid the the higher the likelihood that you're going to end up in a dispute yeah yeah okay um someone's saying regarding smash and grab can you not just do a negative valuation afterwards under a jct um the answer is uh, no, because that the fine, it's a final account. The like the the potential for you know the interim payment process has effectively expired now, and the and you've moved from the interim phase into the into the final account phase. Um. So yeah, no, I, I mean, not really. That, that's that's effectively you you try and do that if if that's what occurs. Um. You. Unless unless a contractor agrees to do that, I mean, but unfortunately, you know, that's it's it's unlikely if the contractor is in a position where he has um, a, a smash and grab entitlement. Um, you know, it's really really does you know what can happen there is that he he proceeds with the adjudication, and um, and then you know the employer wants to you know re adjudicate on the true value. Other than that, the parties can recognise that they're in that situation and and try and deal with it between them at the time. But in that situation, the contractor has the upper hand because he's got the he's got the smash and grab, um, you know, hanging, you know, basically in his pocket. Uh, you know, obviously he's got to he's got to run that. But um, so the you know the contractor, if you don't if you don't issue the you know the final account to set a uh, payment or pay less notice. If the employer doesn't do that, he's he's under pressure because he's he's on the back foot. Um, he's he's on the back foot straight away. He's after giving the advantage effectively to the contractor. And what happens next is effectively uh, decided between you know by the conduct of the parties and and how much um, how much the uh, how much the contractor is willing to pursue it. So okay. you, you know, but I mean, issuing just issuing a negative cert afterwards. When you fail to issue the payment or pay less notice, you're you're really leave, you're really up against it at that stage as the employer. Okay. Yeah. Um, another question: the industry often uses on account payments. What does this mean? How is this dealt with at final payment? Yeah, on account payments, um, they are popular in interim valuations, and really, what it is, uh, in my experience, um. In my in those halcyon days as a QS, Julie, uh, and on account Happy payment, times. Is, <laughs> fun <laughs> times. Uh, a final account, uh, sorry, an on account payment is basically it's like an acknowledgement by the employer that you know the contractor has you know done carried out work, has supplied material, has done something of value, um, and the on account payments basically are used where the parties don't maybe have time or don't have all of the information available to them to actually agree the exact um, amount of what that figure should be. So on account payments, I mean, are, you know, basically are a way to acknowledge that the contractor has done something of value. And in the on account payment, um, it's the employer, basically, it's cash flow for the contractor. To say, mm -hmm. look, I, it's probably going to be worth ten grand, but you know what? I'm going to release maybe seven or eight, or you know, you can release the ten if you want. I mean, you know, it's generally a, a a good way for employers to acknowledge that contractors have done something of value, and uh, you know, basically rewarding the contractor by by you know ensuring that cash flow is there because obviously the contractor's costs have to be paid out either today or or very soon. And mm. you know it's it's right that the employer makes an on account payments in the right circumstances to assist the contractor uh, with his cash flow. So that, mm. and, but generally you should have no on account payments in your final account, though. You know, by the time right. you get to final account, everything should be provided, all the reasonable evidence, all the backup uh, to those previous on account payments that were uh, certified during the interim payment stage. And they should all be really finalised and agreed, um, and as to what those exact figures should be, they, sh they shouldn't continue into the final account. Um, so yeah, so look, basically at interim stage, they're a good way for uh, maintaining cash flow, but should not appear in a final account. Right. Um, 
Is there a distinction between shrinkage and thermal movements during the rectification period? Um, there probably is. It's a, it's a very kind of a, you know, if you're asking that kind of question, you're in a very kind of a technical uh, engineering type um, area, Julie, and I'm not sure I'm best placed to be able to answer that. But look, there, look, all of these things can be, um, you know, they're, they're, they can all be microanalyzed on their own, on their, on their own grounds. I mean, hence why we have experts, you know, we have experts in, yeah. in industry that deal with a lot of um, a lot of our disputes because the these are the type of really kind of technical questions that arise to um, that that need to be settled or a position agreed as to what you know what it is and what the effect of it is um, in order to agree a dispute basically you know um, mm. but look I'm sure there's a difference in them um, they, I, I'm just not sure I'm best placed to answer it. Okay um, going back to what you were, you were saying about the uh, we were about the, the addition of interest on any late payments someone's saying surely the deduction of LDs and the addition of interest on any late payments do not fall within the scope of the final account as they are not covered by the final account rules um, I'm not so sure that they're not covered by the you know under the final account rules I mean you know if if the contractor has been delayed um, and LADs are included as part of the contract. Um, I mean, I don't see, you know, unless someone can point out to me that um, uh, that that you know that that LAD deduction should not be quantified in the final account. I mean, you know, absolutely. I, I mean, I, I I struggle to see why it wouldn't be why it shouldn't be taken into account because if the contractor has been late delivering. And he has signed up to the LADs under the contract. Well, then you know that's what the LADs are for. You know, mm. that's why the parties focused their minds on agreeing the LADs was because they knew, they both knew what the remedy was in the event of late completion. Mm. Now, obviously, if the contractor can justify that he was late, but he was late for reasons down to the employer through the relevant event clauses in the contract, that's a different. I mean, obviously. If he can do that, then he shouldn't be subject to any LADs and there shouldn't be any adjustments for it at final account. Um, mm. But absolutely, it, you know, the LADs can be taken into account in, in the final account. They, I mean, they have to be as a means to, um, you know, to finally, you know, to agree to what the final account figure should be. Um, and similarly okay. with interest, I mean, with, you know, interest the same. I mean, if, if the employer has been late, I mean, look, to be honest, it's, it's rare that uh, it's rare that interest is charged in a, in a final account um, because, you know, interest rates these days, it's hard, they're hardly worth talking about. Um, and most of them are really, really low on contracts as well. And again, it can be a bit of a barrier to just trying to agree your final account when the interest amounts are you know, probably going to be very minor in the in the scheme of things. So, mm. but they, but saying that they can be included. Um, so yeah, I hope that that answers the point there. Okay. Um, someone's asking here: Can you could you achieve practical completion if there are no slabs on top of concrete stairs to the property, although all the rest is completed? That seems like a very specific question. If there, are, sorry, if there are no slabs, there are on, no slabs on top of the concrete stairs to the property, although all the rest is completed. Someone's obviously having a stair issue this week. <laughs> uh, I guess it. I mean, if there were slabs, I mean, you know, go back to what what it says in Keating and what was approved in Mears and Costplan is like, hmm. if the slabs were, it depends on what you know. Were the slabs a post-contract variation? Or were the yeah. slabs part of the original contract? I mean, if they were part of the original contract, you know, the, the second ground under Keating said that you can't get PC if any of the if the, any of the construction work hasn't been complete. Yeah. So it, it goes back to you know what is the nature of the agree you know what is the scope of work agreed in the contract or you know has the work been instructed as you know as a post uh, final account or you know, a post-completion instruction, basically. Okay. So you're going to have to consider, just consider that question and, and it should lead you to the right answer. Okay. If the client wants PC on a particular date and has agreed that the contractor will carry out additional works post-completion, 
can the contractor still claim for additional prelims for supervision for these additional works? Um, it's a very specific question again, I, I, I like it. Um, can the contractor claim for additional prelims? I mean, if the, if the employer knows, if the contractor tells the employer that he's obviously going to be on site for long, you know, beyond the, um, the completion days, and he needs to be in order to complete those works, Julie, it's reasonable. I mean, the, the contractor should be pricing in his prelims for supervision uh, for such work because it's effectively a variation. Um, and yeah, he, I mean, the, the contractor should be entitled to prelims for his supervision, but, you know, I, I'd be pricing that in as part of those, as part of the additional work. I mean, this is variation work. So I'd be at, just add on the, um, add on the supervision costs to the, to the variation costs and it should be fine. Okay. Um, someone else has a quick question in regards to the pain gain share mechanism in the JCT CE target cost option contract. Right. Could you clarify for them that how um, how we are calculating the pain gain share in a final account when we use that particular contract, that JCT CE? Right. Okay. I'm not familiar. I, I must. I have to admit, I'm not familiar with that contract, Julie. Okay. Um, and the pain gain share, I mean, you know, pain gain, we typically associate it with more, you know, FIDIC type contracts or can be, can also be an option in, in NEC as well. Uh, JCT, I'm not, um, yeah, I mean, if if that person wants to email me separately, Julie. Yeah, no problem. I'll get um, that sorted. Yeah, I'll be happy to look into it and, and come back and come back with, you know, with my thoughts on, 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 on the information I've got available, okay? Okay. Um, when a subcontractor prices a variation, how much information or substantiation should they provide? I mean, how far do you go to breaking down a quotation to its constituent parts? Um, again, I, I always say, you know, whatever <coughs> you should, whatever is, you know, re how, how reasonable it, or, or what is reasonable information to provide. I mean, this is always an area of contention as well as you know, what is reasonable information um, that needs to be provided. Um, how much information? I, I mean, do, uh, if they're asking, do you need to show like build up to labor plant materials? Um, it's not unreasonable to be to provide that in in in, cer in some circumstances, um, particularly where you're pricing on um, on first principles. That's the reason, I mean, because if you're pricing at first principles, you're basically saying that I don't have any similar rates in the, in the construction contract. And uh, to be, you know, to, to get a fair and reasonable assessment, um, it's not unreasonable to break a quotation down into a labor plant materials um, ele uh, element into, the, into those effective elements, Julie. So, um, so yeah, it, look, it it depends. I mean, look, it depends on the nature. It's hard to come up with a one size fits all answer to that. It it depends on whatever is you know. I always go back to whatever is reasonable for you to provide, um, to be able to justify, you know, what you spent or what your costs are, and um, and be entitled to payment for that plus your overhead and profits. You know. Okay, we'll do one final question, um, and then there are okay. a couple that have remained unanswered, which we'll forward to you, and, and I'm sure you can deal with those directly if you wouldn't mind. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, but it, the, someone's asking, if the employer wants to delay practical completion because, say, it's a speculative development that remains unlet, what are the employer's best tactics to do so? Um, I mean, if it's a speculative development, I think you know the employer would want um and he know like i mean the employer is going to know that when he's letting the construction contract so if he if if he thinks that's what he's going to want to do during the course of the contract then he should get he should add a clause in the contract to say that um because i mean i, I can't imagine why an, you know an employer wants to delay pc if, if an employer delays pc he's going to delay the contractor if the contractor has his relevant event and relevant event clauses in there, which generally cast, or sorry, they cover most uh, grounds uh, that can possibly occur on a construction contract now because they've basically been developed over many years. 
um, that's going to end up costing the employer time and money. Um, and the contractor will have um, a, a genuine uh, reason to recover uh, loss and expense, which, which, you know, if the employer is not reasonable dealing with it, is going to end up in a dispute. Mm. So really, if the, you know, for the employer, what he's going to want early doors, I mean, he's going to want effectively something like a termination at will clause. Um, or it's, he's going to want something like that drafted into the original construction contract that says if he decides not to proceed with the project, he can give notice to the contractor and the contract is effectively terminated. Now, mm. we can also deal with the issue as to, um, you know, what happens to the contractor's remaining overhead and profit, etc. And that's going to become an area of uh, discussion between the parties as well. Um, so, like on speculative developments, I mean, as an as an employer, you, you you know, you simply have to have the right advice to cater for that at the pre-construction stage because it's very hard to get out of it or try. I mean, even the the thought of trying to, you know, I suppose consciously delay a contractor because you can't sell some of the units. I mean, it just um, you know, it's just a recipe for disaster during the construction mm -hmm. stage. Um, and, and, and if you tell the contractor that's it at early doors, most contractors are reasonable to understand that anyway. And, and mm -hmm. that's the time when you've got to get your agreements to deal with these, which are effectively foreseeable events. Um, and you've got to get um, an agreement in place between the two to, to cater for it at a later date. OK. OK. That's great. Thank you so much, Connor. Um, there was a lot uh -huh. of questions there, so I was firing things at you about all sorts of topics. But thank yeah. you very much for your time. Thank you, everyone, for joining no us. Um, Connor's next QS series is the 7th of April, and that's on payment security. So if you'd like a place on that, please let us know. And then next Wednesday, we have um, recovery of lost expense and global claims, and that's with Richard Silver. So on both of those, if you'd like a place, please email us seminars at silverllp.com and hopefully we'll see you all again very, very soon. Thank you all. Have a great day. Thank you, Connor. Have a great thank day. You, and uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye -bye. Have a good day. Bye.